All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Anne Marie. I'm uh, one of the board members of the VR Air Vancouver chapter um, and also the executive producer of the VR Air Global Summit. So I wanted to welcome all of you tonight to our chapter event. Thank you so much for coming out in the heat. We will refresh you later with cold drinks and beer and wine um, to get you feeling a bit better. Um, tonight's topic is AR um, everywhere. Um, I'm really excited about the speakers that we have tonight and the demos, and so I hope that you'll enjoy this event. Um, just a little bit of the agenda. Um, me doing an intro. Uh, we'll have a keynote from the amazing Marco from the VR Fund. Um, Alex from Shape Immersive will come up and chat about building the AR cloud. Uh, we'll have a panel. Um, and there'll be a Q&A at the end of that panel, um, and then a location-based AR panel, and then um, food and drinks and networking and the chance to demo a bunch of amazing uh, AR apps and experiences. Um, I wanted to thank the sponsors of the event. Without you, it couldn't happen. Um, is anyone here from LNG? LNG? Yay! Oh, there you are. Hi! <laughs> I think you just walked in, right? OK. <laughs> Thank you so much for your continued sponsorship of this event. Uh, is there someone from Gowling in the room? No? Well, we love you, Gowling. You're not here, but we love you. <laughs> uh, Llama Zoo. I know Charles is back there. Thank you so much, Charles. Kindly has paid for all of your drinks and food for this evening. So he gets the biggest <laughs> cheers, always. <laughs> Um, amazing, welcome to the team from Seagraph, who are right back there. Make sure you go and visit them and talk about their amazing event that's coming up later this summer. Um, and Unbounce, thank you so much. I don't know where Matt went. Matt, back there, thank you for hosting us again. We really appreciate your continued support of this event. Um, just for you, who, those of you who don't know, I'm not going to go into great detail, but um, the VR Air Association Vancouver chapter is one of the largest and fastest growing chapters in the world. I think we're the second largest now. Um, we have 52 chapters around the world globally um, and growing every day. Um, and we help basically to foster research, engage in best practices, connect people throughout events. We hold great events throughout the world. Um, so if anyone's interested in more information about the VRARA, uh, Vancouver chapter, or global initiatives, feel free to talk to any of us that are on the board. There's a few stats about it. We have 3,900 plus companies. Um, we have great committees in all of these different areas. So if you're a member, please feel free to join these committees. There's great conversations. They do white papers. Um, there's speaking opportunities in all of these areas. Um, so committees are amazing um, to connect. And there's people, there are people, sorry, from around the globe um, working on all of these committees. And they're a great thing to be a part of. Um, this good looking group of people are your Vancouver VRA chapter board. Most of us are here tonight, so by all means, please feel free to talk to us about anything to do with the chapter, event ideas. Um, if you want to demo at one of our events, we'd love to hear from you and engage you more into our community here in Vancouver. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen it, this is our updated uh, VR AR ecosystem map. There's over 200 companies working in VR AR in Vancouver alone. Um, if you are working in it and don't see your logo on here, please let us know and we'll add it in the next iteration. Um, but we are the second largest VR ecosystem in the world, um, which a lot of people are surprised by. But that's, this is an amazing resource for you. It's up on our website. Um, if you'd like to use it for any reason, feel free to share that globally. Um, just a sample of our global members. We've got Google. We just signed on Meta. Um, we've got some great partners around the world um, in the VRAR Association. And some highlighted Vancouver chapter members as well, um, a lot of who of which are here this evening. Um, I'm just going to do, I'm going to do a quick plug for my event that's in September. Um, so the VRAR Global Summit's coming here in September. We'll be here September 21st and 22nd at the Park Hotel. Um, we have got an amazing list of speakers um, and events that are happening around the summit. Uh, we've got speakers from the Vatican, we've got speakers from the Pentagon, NASA, Intel, uh, Google, Walmart, Wayfair, um, a lot of amazing companies working and in investing in the space. Um, we've got a pitch competition sponsored by 
Alex at Shape Immersive um, with a cash prize of $15,000 for startups that want to compete, and that will be opened up next week, I believe, the pitch session, so uh, the pitch contest, so stay tuned to the website for that. Um, and we've got um, great exhibitor and sponsor opportunities. Um, early bird tickets are still on sale to the end of the month, so it's a great time to grab them. They're half price right now. Um, but if you're looking to exhibit or sponsor or attend or want any information about the summit, please come and talk to me afterwards. We'd love to have you there. We're expecting about a thousand industry people, um, and there'll be parties, um, industry workshops, and it will be an amazing event for the city of Vancouver. Um, so first up, I'd like to welcome Marco Demiris from the VR Fund. Um, I will let Marco introduce himself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm almost matching the same outfit, more or less. <laughs> well, thanks for having me here, and I'm really honored and delighted to be here. Oops, this is, go back. There we go. Um, well, you saw all of my presentation. So um, <laughs> when Dan and I talked about you know coming here and talking to you about AR, AR markets, and AR cloud, um, I really felt uneasy because I feel like you you already know a lot about the AR AR cloud, and as Anne Marie said, this is one of the uh, you know most vibrant uh, AR VR chapters uh, globally. But I'll still make an attempt to sort of take you to a 20-minute journey. And um, you know, my partner, Tip Ted, and I, we talk uh, a lot about um, AR and VR markets global to evangelize and, and educate and really extend our footprint and, and the knowledge. So let me, let me do that. Um, by the way, just going back here. Oops. How do I go back? By the way, oops. It's only going one way, one direction. Okay, so you know we're known as the VR fund, but V stands for venture. So it's really a venture reality fund, and not the virtual reality fund. Uh, when we started this, we thought AR and VR will transform our lives, and uh, and Tibetat's original name was for the fund venture reality fund, and it became a VR fund. But V is for everything. Um, so I'll talk about a little bit about the fund and talk about the sort of state of AR in terms of technology, competitive dynamics. But per my discussions with the with the, the uh, group, I'm going to focus on the cloud and the enterprise side. And by the way, this will be available after a few days. I have one slide that I'm going to share with you before anybody else sees it. Um, uh, but uh, so let me sort of talk about the fund a little bit. Um, we started a little bit over two years ago. Our, you know, I'm coming from mobile gaming entertainment background, and Tipitat similar. And uh, he and I worked at the game company. I was running. If you ever played Diner Dash, that was our game. You know, downloaded close to 900 million times. 85% female audience. Uh, sort of a very interesting platform. It's really a story of a female entrepreneur. And after selling that. I joined an investment firm in LA and ended up investing in Jaunt VR. It was their uh, September 2015, $66 million round. That was the second largest VR or AR investment at that time. And then Magic Leap was happening along the way. Uh, but what Tipitat was, uh, was really bugging me about was he said, look, we should really start our own fund. It's going to change our lives. And in, and he's a designer and creator and technologist at the same time. Along the way, he was writing all these Matrix games. You know, you follow Morpheus and jump over buildings and so forth. And he cured himself of his a fear of heights. It's like, oh, so we had our, he had his aha moment. And I was still caught up with John and, you know, I was at Creative Artists Agency, a part of their investment group and TVG Capital. So we're looking at entertainment, music, and so forth. Tiptat was talking about healthcare, vision, other things. So to make it short, sort of I quit my job, started the fund a little bit over two years ago, and we said we're going to focus on AR, MR, and VR, and also complementary AI, machine learning, and blockchain. Not the crypto side, but blockchain technologies that Alex will talk about. We've been prolific. We've, uh, we invested in 22 companies. Probably before the end of June, we'll have three or four more investments coming up. In our business, it really comes in bits and spurs. And uh, in, you know, since the announcement of AR Core and AR Kit, 
our deal flow shifted to AR, so I'll share all that with you. And we had two exits today. Looks like we're selling our companies to Google eventually. You know, Alchemist started the job simulator, and uh, Google uh, acquired them early on, and then Limitless got acquired by Lytra, got acquired by Google. And, you know, again, I'm not going to do a lot of brag, bragging, you know, sort of chest pounding stuff here, but we really, you know, work pretty hard to make sure that we speak on behalf of the whole community globally. And I go all around Europe, Tibetat goes from China, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and, and our really uh, goal is to, to make sure that we help educate the markets and, and, you know, investors and entrepreneurs and governments globally. And we also, we are very proud to be working closely with the Women in XR Fund, WXR Fund. And as you know, they've had two cohorts so far, and actually one of our uh, newest investment will be one of them. And I'm a big fan of Vancouver, so here we are. Um, our starting vision was that, again, you know, go back two years ago, seems like really a, a decade ago, but two years ago, uh, you know, and still uh, to, to this day, a lot of venture funds are trying to figure out what AR, MR, VR mean to them. And uh, so we thought we'll, we'll provide this bridge between the traditional incubators and accelerators primarily focusing on AR, VR, and, and also traditional venture funds. Our goal was to raise about 40 plus million to invest in 30 some companies. And currently we invest half million to million initial check size. And we always indicate, you know, our model is to really help uh, an entrepreneur or or her team to make sure that they, there's an investor syndicate to help her build the company. We work with everybody and uh, we think we have the best portfolio in the market, uh, but we're biased. So, by the way, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on um, between Charlie Fink and others uh, talking about what's AR, what's MR, what's XR. To me, XR is really convenience, right? Instead of saying AR, MR, VR, I say XR. And then everybody has their own definition, a little bit on XR. Uh, but today we're going to talk about you know, AR part of the spectrum where you have the spatial information, physical environments, and the digital layer on top of it. Uh, why, you know, why there is so much interest, and especially since you know, last September, AR kit and AR core, this is going to be a big market. It's already about a 10 plus billion a year market uh, this year. And I think uh, two, two years ago was about four and a half grew to eight, I think this year will be eight, 10 to 12 billion. But the forecast, if you look at, uh, you know, I don't really believe in this troughs of disillusion and all that kind of stuff, because fundamentally it takes a while for a brand new technology to get adoption and traction. And if you look at the smartphones, 10 years, ATMs, 10 years, and you know, cloud computing, 10 plus years. So it doesn't happen overnight, although it gets, tend to get faster and faster because of the install base. And, but overall, I have another slide coming up after this. So if you look at the breakdown of the market, you know, obviously early years are driven by hardware and VR, and then AR is catching up. So odd years, we're looking at about 100 plus billion a year market, 50-50 between AR and VR. And our overall expectations for Tipitat and I, we're looking at really sort of convergent devices. You'll have a mixed mode glass that will do AR and MR, maybe even the fully immersive VR experience simultaneously. So, but again, there are a lot of uh, forecast numbers uh, in the market. This is Goldman Sachs and DigiCapital has similar. So numbers go from you know, 80 billion to 200 billion. Who's in, everybody's in. I mean, from Alibaba to Tencent. Amazon to House and, and Walmart, uh, everybody's really investing in AR and VR. Uh, from the entertainment companies, you know, US, Europe, and the obviously media giants like Time Warner to, um, you know, the, the retailers and, 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 you know, journalism and media, entertainment, everybody is really experimenting. As you've seen in the beginnings, again, two, three years ago with the journalism, tourism, now we're seeing AR versions of that. If you look at our portfolio as an index of the market, when we you know, made the first 15 investments, they were all VR focused companies. 85% of them had AR in their product roadmap, but AR wasn't ready for them. So I think platform, you know, platform wars are helpful and hurtful at the same time, right? Because the fragmentation doesn't help the developer community. What we really want is a very robust, uh, environment from a developer perspective so that 
they can you know, come up with great ideas and, and having the basic tools and infrastructure and, and workflow to come up with the either enterprise apps, or consumer apps, or whatever that they, their creative forces you know, uh, uh, manifest. Uh, again, fragmentation is hurtful, also helpful at the same time. If you look at the dynamics now between ARKit and ARCore, we have ARKit 2.0 came out, and ARCore is now cross-platform. ARCore runs on iOS. So the competition between, especially sort of two native, the largest you know, smartphone platforms between iOS and Android is really helpful, and because you don't have to do a lot of low-level stuff, right? The native uh, solution gives you uh, all this, uh, most of the tools you need. And this will continue. So part of uh, our you know, evangelism for, on behalf of you, all of you, is really sort of to come up with some uh, communication you know, messaging and, and really sort of educating global markets about how robust this market is. And Tipitat started doing this about two and a half years ago. And if you looked at his landscape two and a half years ago for the VR market, and you would probably see a third of the companies. And the way this works, by the way, go from sort of left to right, middle, and snake around and go up top. So from left to right in the bottom, you have the HMDs, you know, basically the, the sort of like the hardware layer primarily. You have the HMDs, and by the way, this is on our website. Uh, and then you have the haptics and input devices, and then the far right cameras and, you know, capture, volumetric light field, and then the tools and engine, engines, and then the publishing in the middle left, and then from left to right, um, this is really sort of common. When you have a technology transition, games and entertainment industry tend to lead other sectors. And so what you're seeing is when the VR first came out, you know, you have a lot of game companies developing, you know, incredible uh, epic games in terms of the AAA quality as well as, you know, doing on the mobile platform. And now what we're seeing on the VR front is enterprise adoption. So we're really seeing you know, growth going from left to right, from entertainment games to common or horizontal enterprise apps as well as verticals. Uh, so you are the first audience seeing this. Tipitat is almost done with the AR landscape and will publish it formally next, uh, probably Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so if you have a picture of it, don't share it for a while. And otherwise, I'll come after Dan and Anne Marie. Uh, but again, if you had looked at it, the, the first one we published about a year ago, it, it was approximately a quarter of this. And uh, so this is as recent as what happened at AWE a couple of weeks ago. And uh, again, what you're seeing from left to right is you know, the glasses and uh, handheld uh, mixed reality devices, the input, haptics, vision, reality capture or vision capture, tools and SDKs and distribution. Again, left to right is entertainment games, consumer and enterprise, and then the verticals. Uh, I'm sorry, mine is older than yours. Uh, so I, I, I think I grabbed this from probably Dan's presentation some time ago and clearly I'm out of date, but uh, the message here is, you know, why I'm here and why I'm excited to be here is you have an incredible community. And the only ingredient, in my opinion, and I hope there are not very many VCs here, but the, the capital is missing. You have incredibly high quality, you know, entrepreneurs. You have incredibly, you know, attractive and appealing and commercial viable ideas and big vision. What's really missing is the capital infusion. And some of your colleagues told me, and, and you know what we do is when we invest in another country, um, I'm not going to get into politics, so I'll skip that part. You know, we, we look for local VCs to to collaborate with because we don't know all the jurisdictional stuff. And some of your colleagues said you're wasting your time. Bring your syndicate with you. There's no local syndicate here, but it's really early for me to figure out who are who is investing locally. And and our, my goal is really to build a sort of network of investors early stage. And, and really invest in you guys. So hopefully, when I talk about our portfolio a year from now, you'll see some companies from Vancouver, BC, and, and other parts of Canada. So, you know, a lot of people talk about AR Cloud, and Alex, I think, will do a much better job than I'll ever attempt to do. He's coming right after me. But I'll attempt to sort of tell you what I think of AR Cloud. And to start with my favorite AR Cloud, this is sort of, 
everybody has their biases, my biases uh, uh, about Vancouver. By the way, I always tried to be a Canadian citizen, and it's easier to be a citizen as an entrepreneur than as an investor. So um, maybe I'll start a company in Vancouver. But so let's talk about what really makes it an AR cloud. And uh, I want to give credit to our friends at uh, Super Ventures. Tom and Ori have been thought leaders in AR cloud, and and sort of. You know, if you listen to Ori and, and Matt and Tom, they talk about AR Cloud. They've been talking about it for a long time. And there are several definitions. And, and I think Alex will probably get into a little bit more uh, detailed version of this thing. One is like it's operating system for spatial computing. You know, you have the spatial information, you have the physical layer, and you need this AR Cloud to become the sort of OS level to, to make sure that everybody has the foundational uh, you know, access to that information. The other part is like real-time spatial map of the world, and and then digital, you know, replica of the physical environment, or as a shared screen. And and what you're really seeing is that fundamentally, having a digital layer over a physical spatial information, and 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 then it'll have certain attributes. So what are those attributes? Um, so one of the attributes is, uh, again, uh, some of them are you know, intertwined with each other, but it has to organize data in its original place. And Ori talks about in situ a lot. I'm like, oh, I saw, that's pretty sophisticated. So I looked it up. It means it's origin. So, um, so you really have to have the you know, information at the origin. If I leave an object here for Anne Mary, she should come and see it at the same place. So they're really having the objects, they're having the information and data at the origin, and the where you intend it to be is really important, and AR Cloud has to, has to accomplish that. The other part is it has to be persistent, but persistent can be controlled by you. So if, if, if somebody leaves an information or an image or a gift or something at a location, you can have it be persistent for a day, month, hours, right? But it has to be persistent and at least have the option. And it has to be persistent in, in real environment. So you have the spatial information. Whatever you create has to be persistent in that environment. And across space, time, and devices. Sounds a little bit like a Star Trek, but it's really important to have this intersection of across you know, ubiquity over devices and space and time intersection is important. Again, controlled by you. You can choose to have temporal you know, duration, but it should be controlled by you. And then the, these scalability, you know, real-time, multi-user, shareable part are all related to each other because, um, you know, from the enterprise to consumer, it's much more engaging if you have a social experience. If you're looking at a game or, or messaging app and, and, and social AR or enterprise, you know, you want to be able to scale to have hundreds, maybe thousands of millions of people using it, right? And you also want the option of having real-time so that Maybe 50 of us here watch, uh, go and, and sort of share data or look at a new product design or even you know, look at a, a soccer game on a tabletop. And, uh, and then instant localization, if you're familiar with the SLAM algorithms, you know, AR class should be able to recognize where it is, uh, you know, understanding physical environment and localize it and then bring the digital layer on top of that. So, so those are the general attributes of AR Cloud. Now, let's talk about what really makes it adopted and grow. You know, grow. And uh, part of it is things beyond our control, meaning that we really want the devices to come out there. We want the phones with depth cameras, right? If you know, right now we have mono information, but eventually, you know, dual and depth cameras uh, uh, will make it much, much easier from both developer and consumer perspective. And, I de and also, we really want to have open source access to information. As you know, Niantic has been building its own environment. And Alex will talk about Shape Immersive, what he is doing, his version of it, and, and leveraging blockchain. It doesn't have to be blockchain, but blockchain is, is really great for content accumulation and distribution and publishing and sharing. And, and also, we should have standards so that if you're a developer writing an app or you know, coming up with an idea, you don't have to figure out all these different fragmented environments. And along with that, privacy and security really matter, right? Because you're sharing information about my preferences, my games, or my entertainment, my friends, and that should be protected. 
And Web AR is, as you know, Mozilla just announced recently, and I think Chrome is supporting as well. Um, and then, you know, having browser-based AR experience and also having these next generation of smart, you know, AR glasses um, will change things because ultimately you really want to have something like this that I can have the information over and, and, and then have the input mechanism on top of it. You know, phones are great. Phones give you, uh, in, in, you know, immediate access to currently 400 and sort of 50 million phones based on AR kit and AR core. But ultimately, the great AR device is your glasses, or something like that. And we also need entrepreneurs, investors, and government, right? And what we're seeing, similarly, you know, to what, what I'm seeing in Canada, in Europe, governments are becoming very active. Active funding the you know, venture funds, active funding uh, entrepreneurs. And what you have here is this great tax regime that U.S. hasn't seen. And you have incredible access to talent and government funding to, to really sort of uh, provide additional runway and, and stretch your dollars uh, on top of it. So the government involvement is important, but ultimately you really need the first two components uh, very much in, in line with each other. That's really the beauty of Silicon Valley. You have 600 venture funds between San Jose and San Francisco, and you have literally thousands of companies starting because of that. Um, AR Cloud landscape is growing, you know, starting with UAR Shape Immersive, Occipital 6 in a, in Mat 60 that AI and, and Ubiquity 6. There's, uh, you know, this is sort of very much what happens in early stage in a market. You have a lot of companies taking a different perspective of the AR class. Some of our broad general purpose AR class, some are very sort of focused AR class uh, uh, ideas. But uh, as you can tell from this, I think uh, probably half of them are already funded. So let's talk about AR and how AR is expanding across the enterprise. And uh, so I'll try to capture, how am I doing time-wise, Emery? Five minutes? OK. I'm on time. So we'll talk about entertainment, media, education. But the answer is pretty much every industry sector is doing something with AR and VR. And even the ones that you would say boring and you know, backward, you can talk to Lama. They'll tell you how oil and gas and mining industries are adopting uh, in these emerging technologies. So, look, AR Kid and AR Core uh, announcement and availability in September of last year, it's been really tr uh, transformative. And uh, if you were to look at our deal flow, and by the way, Tipitan and I, we met with and interacted with over 4,000 companies since we started about two and a half years ago. And our deal flow before and after AR Kid and AR Core changed dramatically. Right now, probably 65, 70% of our deal flow is AR related. And uh, obviously, you know, having the native capability opens up a lot of great innovations and ideas. So I'm going to skip this because a lot of enterprises are doing stuff from e commerce to retail to product design to training and collaboration. Um, and, and, you know, we talked about the gaming entertainment side. Gaming always leads just because it, game developers love to experiment with new platforms and Unity, Unreal, and other uh, you know, engines also jump on it uh, to make sure that they, they keep up with the uh, uh, technology transformation. But gaming is, you all know about it, from the sort of simple tabletop games to just AR games uh, in, a, in a spatial you know, setting, as well as um, psychedelic uh, AR experience to go along with your music choice. And the bottom right is Uni University of Washington um, experiment, watching a, a sort of real soccer game on a tabletop. So you can you can have six of us and uh, watch the World Cup. Um, again, this, these are early experimentation. Imagine what's going to happen a year from now, two years from now. Uh, on the sort of consumer enterprise in you know, education, tourism, journalism, some of them really, you look at a, a, a painting and, and really discover about the artist and his or her background and history or any sort of um, land piece or city that you travel, you can get the news about the city or get the highlights of what's going on in the city. And, and tourism, journalism, education are very sort of, I would say, low hanging fruits for AR and VR. And on the AR application enterprise, there's a sort of component of 
enterprise application, what we would call horizontal, that is pretty much applicable to any enterprise, right? Part of it is product design, you know. Product design from complex to simple and from single user to multi-user. Again, you have six of us put our you know, AR glasses on, look at a product design that um, and I came up with, uh, or somebody, uh, you can comment, you can improve. It really improves the communication and product design process dramatically. On this sort of big data, everybody has a big data. This is a company called Virtualytics. They have it in both AR and VR. You know, uh, I was reading this Harvard Business School article. It said 95% of data collected to date, since the inception of the recorded human history, has happened in the last two years. That's an incredible statement, right? 95%, even like 80% would be phenomenal, but 90 some percent is unbelievable. That shows you how exponentially the data is growing from IoT to everything else. So again, that's a horizontal application. And, and as Lama Zoo uh, friends know, they do from big oil companies to mining, and it's for retail, e-commerce, everything, right? Horizontal app. And field services, repair, auto, you know, uh, and uh, maintenance. Again, when you're out there, you're experiencing something that you haven't done before. By the way, DOD in the US especially has always been at the forefront of new technology adoption. They fund millions and millions of dollars and spent all that to really, uh, to, to provide additional funding that it doesn't get on the radar screen in the US that much because everyone talks about venture capital, but DOD has been one of the big sources of uh, capital for emerging technology companies. And in this case, you're seeing a Marine tackling something, and the bottom right is a field service technician trying to figure something out, and uh, I'm there struggling, and my manager says, go this way and open up the box. So it really makes it much easier, much more efficient, and also eliminates errors, right? And in the retail, it eliminates returns. These are all hard dollars that you save. And medical, honestly, there's self-explanatory. If you talk to Periopsim and, and other uh, innovators in this field, you can see the benefit of technology uh, in AR helping uh, from mental to you know, diagnostics to physical. And uh, I have a, just a short story, if I can tell. So, in the US, I don't know the Canadian health system. It's real tough to find a doctor. So eventually I found a general practitioner because you want to get your annual check and everything. So I scheduled it and I signed a bunch of pieces of paper. You always sign it because you don't know what they're saying, but there's some warning about technology. Anyway, my doctor walks in with one of these uh, on his face. And I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. He's like, I hope you're not scared. I'm like, I said, no. He said, um, this is what I call smart glass. I'm like, great. And he's like, are you uncomfortable? I'm like, no, I'm not uncomfortable. I understand this. I mean, I know a little bit about it. He's like, yeah, wow. Because he says, some people asked them to remove it. And they felt very invaded. In, and so he was giving me a lecture about AR. I said, I really support what you're doing. Don't worry about me. I'm totally fine with that. But, but it's even happening at a patient level. And... Uh, the medical field, by the way, has been phenomenal in terms of their you know, adoption of technologies for AR and VR, from training to actual surgeries and collaborative surgeries and, and it, you know, all aspects of it. I wouldn't have guessed it before, but it's happening. My last slide, I have one more to go. And uh, obviously, the social part is really important. If you look at WeChat, WeChat has about, I think, 1.2 million users. WhatsApp 1.4, I'm sorry, billion. One, uh, WhatsApp has 1.4 billion, and Facebook Messenger is about 800 plus million. They're all incorporating AR, right? From, you talk about the Bitmoji, you know, Facemojis and all that kind of stuff. They are incorporating AR because a part of our social experience. You know, when I tell you something about my experience, I can put a little face there, I can add little color, little you know, component in AR to really sort of extend and enhance the story. And if you haven't seen the video about hyperreality, I really urge you to go watch it. It may corrupt you forever in terms of uh, what the future will unfold for AR or mixed reality. But it's an interesting way of looking at uh, um, how the, these technologies would truly really impact the social interactions and social uh, lifestyles. So 
after having said all that, where are we investing, right? And we're investing actively. We don't do hardware investments. We're $50 million funds, so too, you know, we're too small for hardware. But we're investing in the middle layer, the tools and platforms and you know, workflows so that developers have the you know, capabilities to rapidly deploy and develop uh, new applications. And then top layer, we're going from games entertainment to horizontal enterprise apps as well as verticals. You know and uh, healthcare, education, and then and other aspects of it. So we're excited about the industry. We're excited about what's happening with AR, AR cloud, and AR applications. Uh, we're obviously early in the market, but I'm also excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I hope to do this again, and I hope this was helpful to you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? OK. So on the web AR side, what I was talking about earlier was it's one of the sort of drivers for growth and adoption. And what Mozilla and Chrome are doing or enabling is really relevant. We're seeing a number of applications in web AR to really open the, the platform to the masses. It makes developer easy, development easy, so you don't have to rely on the app store. And uh, as you know, if, if you know, I'm coming from the mobile gaming side, Sometimes it takes you up to three, four weeks to get an app up and running because you submit and something goes wrong and if Apple is busy and so having a browser-based experience is really important to, uh, for rapid adoption of AR and VR in general. One more. Big four meaning? So on the device side, expect, so uh, Tim Cook, what I heard, has been traveling and in person has been really evangelizing AR and underlying how committed Apple is to AR. And expectations based on their hiring in the Valley is they're going to have their own AR device pretty soon. And Google, as you know, they sort of consolidated Tango and everything else and behind AR Core. Right now, there's a fierce com competitive dynamics going on between AR Core and AR Kit, which is great for all of us, right? It's going to make our jobs much easier from a developer perspective. And Google also indicated ambitions to have their device AR glasses. Um, you know, Facebook's vision has always been, you know, having billion people using VR and AR uh, by 2020. And they're working on both, you know, the Instagram side for AR, uh, Messenger side for AR, and as well as the Facebook uh, side for both AR and VR. And uh, uh, Microsoft and Amazon, I think, also big five probably. And I would add Tencent and Alibaba to that. They're all working on something. I think they're again, their investments are relevant to what we're doing. Their investments are very healthy for the uh, ecosystem. And, and frankly, they'll be, they have been, and they'll continue to acquire companies. So, but I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Oh, Alex. Um, Marco will be joining us back up here in September at the summit and is one of the judges of the Pitch Fest that we were talking about earlier. So by all means, chat with him while he's here. Um, and. We'll be back. Now on to Alex from oh. Shape Immersive. Thank oh, you. Awesome, thank you. Here. Yeah, I do. How's everyone doing tonight? Awesome? Do you want to stand up and stretch, or you're good for another, you know, maybe 13 minutes of uh, rambling on the, the AR cloud? <laughs> cool. You guys are good? Cool, awesome. So my name is Alex. I'm co-founder and CEO of Shape Immersive. I'm also one of the board directors at the VR AR Association. And one of the biggest reasons why we organize events like this is so that we can start to have a meaningful conversation around our industry's toughest challenges as well as its biggest opportunities. So tonight, I'm really excited to uh, have a conversation with you on the AR cloud. All right, let's get right in. So ever since the beginning of the information age, we've been consuming digital information through a box. So this is a box. This is a box. This is a box, 
and these are all boxes. And we've been doing this for the last 68 years. So <laughs> you guys know who this is. So for the very first time in the history of computing, augmented reality will allow us to interact with digital experiences that are not bounded by a box. This means that our experiences can be so much more natural, so much more intuitive, and so much more immersive. Wouldn't it be incredible if we can travel back in time and learn the history of any place? And wouldn't it be stress-free if we can navigate any city uh, without the need of a map or a translator? And wouldn't it be life-changing if AR can help blind people see again? Well, if AR is so profound, why does it still struggle to hit, uh, to break through the novelty phase? When was the last time someone tapped on your shoulder and said, hey, you got to download this amazing AR application? Well, as a user experience designer, I'm very curious to understand why AR hasn't hit the mainstream yet. And through my research, I discovered this concept called the AR cloud. And it's what's necessary for the mass adoption of AR. So by definition, the AR cloud is a machine-readable, one-to-one scale model of the world. Some people call it uh, the world's digital twin. Others think of it as a real-time spatial map of the world. Personally, I like to think of it as a digital parallel universe that perfectly overlays on top of our real world. And last month, I was just at Augmented World Expo, which is the, the world's uh, leading AR conference in the world. And I spoke with a lot of experts working on the AR cloud. And they all believe that the AR cloud is going to be the single most important software infrastructure in the history of computing. And it's going to be far bigger than Facebook's social graph and Google's search index. So why is the AR cloud so important? Well, since the dawn of time, humans have always uh, shown a strong affinity to share and collaborate, right? We're inherently social creatures, so it is in our DNA to share and collaborate. And this is the whole reason why we built roads, the internet, satellite network, so we can communicate with one another and share our experiences. And it's no different for augmented reality, right? We must be able to interact with virtual experiences in real time with one another or else it's going to feel like surfing the web without any friends. So let's talk about how to build the AR cloud. And to understand all this, uh, we must examine the three key components of the AR cloud. The first one is a shareable and persistent point cloud. So in a coordinate system, a point cloud is simply a set of data that is defined by its x, y, and z coordinates. And it's typically used to represent the external surface of an object. So for example, this is a point cloud of the Colosseum. But in the context of the AR cloud, these point clouds will have to align to real world coordinates. The second component is an instantaneous and ubiquitous localizer. Localizing simply means that the camera will have to understand its precise spatial coordinates uh, relative to its environment. So if the AR cloud were to exist today, the camera would be able to identify the key features of the scene and then compare them with what's stored on the AR cloud to find a match. And once that match is found, the camera will be able to understand its position as well as its orientation. So you can actually view the experience from any angle. And the third is the ability to allow for real-time multi-user interaction. So just a couple of weeks ago, both uh, Apple and Google have demonstrated some form of a uh, multiplayer AR experience. Uh, and Apple, um, I think two weeks ago at WWDC, uh, they demonstrated this uh, multiplayer AR game, uh, it's a slingshot game, where two players would be able to interact uh, with the game in real time. Uh, but personally, I think this experience is still very limited because there's no real connective tissue between the virtual content and the real world. So what did we end up doing? Well, we went to uh, prove out uh, why the AR cloud is important and why it matters. So I want to give a shout out to Aaron Hilton here. So Aaron's the mastermind. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he, 
he made this uh, in uh, four weeks as well, so it's uh, incredible. So, uh, so Aaron is the mastermind behind uh, KittyCon, and it's the world's first uh, multiplayer mixed reality experience that's also incredibly spatially accurate. So what we ended up doing was we created uh, a six foot tall uh, replica of the Empire State Building. We programmed the ca uh, virtual cat to interact with it. And the cat is spatially aware, so it actually understands the geometry and the structure of the building. So it can do really cool things like climb on the, uh, the edges, uh, and it can also be occluded behind the building. So occlusion simply means that uh, you know, hiding virtual objects behind physical ones. Uh, we also do things like collision really well, so um, that means colliding virtual objects with physical objects. So here's Aaron playing with his friend uh, Melissa, and they're trying to build uh, a barrier around uh, the uh, the structure here, and before you know, Kitty Kong goes on and destroys the world. So Kitty Kong is also uh, uh, actually uh, actually understands the position of the players as well, so it'll throw like mini cat minions at you, or shoot laser out of his eyes. So, uh, so it's really cool, and uh, we demonstrated this at AWE uh, this year, and we're demonstrating it again uh, tonight, uh, and uh, so definitely come check it out during the networking portion of the, the events. So okay, let's do a quick review here. So the Air Cloud will become the operating system for applications in the spatial era. Everything will run off of it. And to build the AR Cloud, we need to capture depth data as uh, often as possible so we can keep the AR Cloud up to date. And today, nobody owns the AR Cloud. But as Marco has uh, shown you guys, uh, there are actually a lot of uh, AR Cloud startups that have emerged from stealth mode uh, just in the last three months alone. So uh, if you're a developer, um, I highly encourage you to check out these companies, uh, experiment with their SDK, so we can start to consolidate uh, knowledge around creating uh, persistent AR experiences. And my company, Shape Immersive, we're uh, interested in tackling the first component of the AR cloud, which is the shareable and persistent point cloud. So we're building a decentralized marketplace for geospatial data, and we want to make this data universally accessible so anyone can create scalable and persistent AR experiences. And personally, I think that blockchain technology has a role in accelerating the creation of the AR cloud. Uh, in the very near future, billions and billions of people will have uh, smartphones that are capable to capture the step data. So if you can incentivize them to uh, capture this data, then the AR cloud would be uh, constantly up to date. So before I wrap up, I just want to uh, acknowledge Ori and Bar uh, for starting the AR cloud movement. So Ori is a partner at Super Ventures, which is an early stage uh, AR fund. And he's also one of the co-producers of AWE. So a lot of the materials I present to tonight uh, are inspired by his uh, series of blog posts. So I definitely recommend you to uh, follow him on Medium and uh, check that out. And I also want to uh, give a shout out to the, uh, the VR AR Association. So um, I've been a member for about a year now, and I got a ton of value from the association. So if you're not yet a member, uh, come talk to one of us. Can I have all the board directors to just you know, raise your hand? Awesome. And all the team members? Yeah. Cool, awesome. So uh, come talk to one of us uh, if you're interested and if you're serious about building uh, a company in the uh, VR AR industry. That's all I have for you uh, today. Thank you so much for your attention. Again, my name is Alex, and I look forward to uh, meeting some of you. Okay, cool. Well, welcome to the panel. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, nice to meet you. I've yeah. met you before. Hey, and hey, <laughs> we're together before. Awesome. So let's get this uh, panel started. How's everyone doing? Do you still need to stand up and stretch, or you're good to power another? You know, 20 minutes of uh, in-depth com conversation on the AR cloud. You good? You guys good? Want water or anything? No? Okay. Yeah, let's, because uh, I think the, yeah, or maybe we can just turn it off. Yeah. Uh, the projector? <laughs> yeah, this, this is actually an AR uh, <laughs> experiment here. We're doing projection AR. So, <laughs> so we're, yeah, we're we're augmenting their uh, their name and their <laughs> job title here. Cool. So I got a bunch of questions I want to ask you guys. 
<laughs> so when, when Amory and I, we, when we first planned this event, Amory was like, hey, do you want to be on the panel for AR Cloud? And I said, uh, no, I definitely got more questions than answers. So, uh, so that's why I'm the moderator for tonight's panel. So uh, let's give our panelists a huge round of applause. Uh, okay, get that branding, steampunk branding on. Yeah, cool, cool, awesome. So uh, let's start with uh, easy questions. So uh, Aaron, why don't you start us off by introducing yourself and who you are and what you do. All right. Um, hey everyone, uh, I'm Aaron Hilton. I run uh, a company called Steampunk Digital. Um, I've been involved with the Vancouver virtual reality scene uh, since 2013. Um, I've uh, just had a really deep drive and passion to do virtual reality tech. Uh, so lately, I've been doing a lot of mixed reality uh, engineering. So some core technology uh, in collaboration with Excipital, um, with uh, the Bridge Engine, which we, which is the underlying technology for Kitty Kong. Uh, and um, uh, more lately, more um, like experiential stuff, like uh, what we did with Kitty Kong itself. So. Hi, I'm Jordan Brighton. I'm CEO, CTO of Virtro Entertainment. We are a mixed reality production company. Uh, I got into VR about two and a half years ago when I started doing a bunch of hackathons down in Seattle and San Francisco and got very excited about the possibilities of AR and VR then. Uh, my company, uh, likes to experiment as well with a lot of new technologies. Our core is doing VR applications, but we've been experimenting for the last six months with AR and multiplayer AR in particular, because I think, uh, I, just, I feel like multiplayer is the reason that we should be doing AR. My name is uh, Mo Samani. I was standing outside and they asked me to join the panel, so I have no idea what I'm gonna talk about. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, no, I run a, uh, I'm sorry, I'm an investor and a partner and a shareholder with a company called A Theater. Uh, and my role in the company is to, as a senior director, I talk to CEOs and C-level um, um, executives in enterprise world to put AR on their roadmap. And what we focus on is field service, dealer service, industrial job area. So that's basically what we do. All right, let's get this panel started. So first question is, you know, what are some of the profound use cases of uh, AR Cloud? And perhaps when we can start us off with some enterprise use case, uh, and then uh, maybe we'll move on to the consumer use case, and then Aaron can give us a, a bigger picture of um, the, the other use cases that uh, you've um, you know, researched. Sure, yeah. So um, uh, how many people here are in enterprise or industrial job industry? Um, so basically, I'll try to give you a, a nutshell of some of the use cases uh, that we work with. Um, one is dealer service or field service. So um, we're not in the sexy part of AR. We're just meat and potatoes company. What we do is we help anybody that works with their hands that builds things and fixes things. So uh, an example would be automotive, right? So a use case would be there would be remote co collaboration. So I think Marco had put up something on field service there. Um, it's around being uh, ha having an ec uh, a field technician or a dealer technician working on a car and he can't seem to fix a complex problem and he needs to contact somebody. And so what he does now with AR is he connects with the glasses or a, pair or a smartphone or a tablet and he connects to somebody anywhere in the world that could help him and makes him feel like he's in front of that car to walk through step-by-step -step process. So that's a use case right there. Another one is inspections and checklists, uh, safety regulations, training, uh, anything that requires um, uh, a technician to be able to learn or to be able to do something with his hands where they need somebody to, that is an expert somewhere around the world that can actually help him right where he is without having that expert to fly in um, or to have to fix the problem themselves directly. So that's basically there. So uh, we do uh, warehouse picking. So I'm not sure if it doesn't even know what warehouse picking is, right? So basically somebody goes into an Amazon warehouse and they have to pick a box, put it onto a, a skid. Skid has to take it to a, to a uh, truck and it goes out to a FedEx and sends it out. What we do is we make sure there's no errors around that. So we uh, provide through the smart glasses, the guy who's doing the picking, they'll tell him how many boxes he has to pick, 
um, where he has to send it to, which aisle he has to go to, and he can do that process instantaneously without any type of training whatsoever, because it all shows up step by step on his glasses, so something like that. So there's different types of use cases, but some of those, some of those are the key ones, and the industries are construction, automotive, oil and gas, energy. Uh, we work with, um, uh, like our customers are like Porsche North America, um, Honda, uh, GE, uh, Volkswagen, Nestle, Barry, Flex, all those type of organizations, so. Awesome. Uh, consumer use cases. So um, I'm coming from the entertainment industry, and I think that uh, there is some really compelling, fun Kitty Kong experiences that we can uh, put all over our cities. Uh, we're working on a game at the moment called Tedden, which is an AR-based uh, teddy street fighter game, and the concept of that is uh, you train a teddy bear, but then you take it out to the streets to fight other teddy bears, and it's location-based, so um, kind of cross with Pokemon Go, but, um, you know, very interactive, and also multiplayer, so you can play other people, and you can have street brawls and stuff. But um, it's going to be very location-based. Um, part of our concept of that from... Um, taking it into pubs and clubs and stuff like that is that we can have a special uh, sponsored bear that you can only fight in one particular <laughs> location. So it's a new idea that we're uh, exploring, but we've got some really good feedback um, and it's fun and it's different. Uh, so that's just one example. I think uh, walking tours in cities. So I've been a tourist all over the world and I <coughs> love the idea of an AR guide taking me through like that picture you saw with the history as well if we could overlay history of what a street used to look like in vancouver we have uh, so many films we should be able to go to a street and have a look and be able to completely overlay you know deadpool over the street so that we can see what it looks like and it should move it should work with the movie um, those kind of uh, uses for having a second digital world i think are really exciting and entertaining and interesting and i think would drive uh, consumer adoption to download these things onto their mobile phones and start using them. Um, all right, so broader picture, okay. Um, so I did a little bit of homework on uh, where this stuff could really become fabric uh, of our everyday lives. And I th really think that every display uh, will have some spatial awareness. Um, have you guys seen um, uh, uh, like like projection mapping where they shoot a projector onto the side of a building and it and it has all these like cool effects and they even like play with the window frames and make them like flex and distort the building and that kind of thing? That's um, spatial awareness in action with a projected surface. So you can kind of expand that out to everyday devices like every one of your phones in your pocket has the fundamental capabilities of being spatially aware with its front-facing camera. So it could identify where it is in 3D space, you put the phone down, and then you, with a pair of glasses, you could like look at it and beam whatever is in your augmented operating system to your phone display. That's where display surfaces become uh, just like uh, a universality of, of, of common interaction with people that don't necessarily have the fancy glasses, but lets everyone just see that thing together. Um, so the only way to make that work is if you have this AR cloud as a pervasive medium that is uh, persistent through space and time. Uh, and I say through time because if you were to look as uh, on the enterprise side at uh, under the hood of your car and you go, oh, um, how does this work? And you, like, how do I take this apart? Um, that could just be uh, a recording of that spatial map of under the hood. Um, the deconstruction of your vehicle, uh, of the engine parts is pretty structured. So you can just associate that through uh, a pre-recording of the deconstruction of your engine and teach you how to do it, how to do the oil changes, how to do the, the replacements of certain parts. Um, so it can become spatially uh, a Wikipedia of how your engine works. So these kinds of capabilities of spatial awareness inside spaces, uh, around your space, um, and everywhere, 
will be really, really handy. And who knew? It's mostly just a math problem at this point. These devices already have the necessary sensors and equipment on board and compute capacity to do all of this. So now we just have to think our way through the problems. Awesome. So w one of the bigger promises of AR is that it's um, able to organize information at its origin. So I think everybody here, um, you know, describes some forms of, uh, of that. Uh, so my next question is, you know, um, you know, in my presentation, presentation I mentioned that uh, the first component of the AR cloud is a, a shareable and persistent point cloud. So how do we actually capture this spatial data? Um, and you know what kind of technology exists uh, today uh, that allows us to uh, to do so. So maybe Aaron, you can start us off, and then uh, maybe Jordan and Mo uh, can chime in as well. Uh, to capture the data, um, your um, just a color camera uh, on your phone is good enough to start capturing spatial data. I don't know if you guys have heard of a product called Reality Capture. Um, it's really neat. It does what's called photogrammetry, where you can throw a crap load of photos at it. And you don't even have to do anything special with the camera. You can just like, take tons of pictures, and it will figure it out, the uh, correlation of all the photos. It's not particularly efficient. You need a pretty beefy machine to put it all together. But it does give you spatial data in the end. It does give you a point cloud that can be fairly accurately registered. Um, and it's pretty automatic which is kind of amazing. So now we have to think of ways to make it more mm, quick and you know, make it more fluid. So I work with a company uh, I co on contract uh, called Excipital, and they provide a, a depth sensor. That simplifies the problem immensely because you're range finding with a laser grid onto your real world. Uh, so you, you know exactly what the depth and color of that information is, uh, and you don't have to guess. So now you know the exact scale of things. You don't have to try to do tricks with the math of the gyro and accelerometer and move the phone around to establish scale. Uh, you can just look at it, and it's got an instant, instantaneous snapshot. So when we map uh, Kitty Kong, it's like painting with light, and that constructs our uh, data set that, that we can track on and relocalize with. So I think uh, there's a lot of different ways to collect the data. Um, and maybe from a more commercial way, people using HoloLenses to collect inside information. Because uh, I feel like lots of people are mapping the outside of our world right now. But I think part of the power of this is having the insides of our world mapped too. Um, so I know. Uh, HoloLens did a lot of things with mapping. You could map your whole house. It will understand where all your rooms are. Um, and then contextually, you can play games within your own space, like um, the characters in the games can move and know where the walls are in your own house so that things are all localised. And ongoing, I feel uh, we need more mapping of the insides of everywhere. So that... Uh <laughs> and, and that's where things like the, the phone comes in if people can start contributing and I think that's kind of what you're talking about doing isn't it yeah. so contributing to um, to this worldwide map of of the world so uh, uh, the Matterport as well does a very good job of scanning internal systems so if there was uh, anyone here who wanted uh, to have this kind of information I think there's really good services and hardware out there and has been out for actually years that can can provide this service I think on the, um, on the space that we're in, on the enterprise side, I think we're a little bit behind in that in terms of field service work, uh, industrial job areas. Um, it's coming along slowly, but I think the key thing that our industry or our area has been really focused on is how do we help a customer reduce errors, reduce downtime, and save money on travel. Those are the real three areas that we work on. The biggest challenge that we find in our area is content. So uh, I'll give you an example, San Diego Hy Hydro that we're working with right now. Um, they have a truck that they take 300 feet down, and it's got, for that day, all the manuals, the, uh, the uh, drawings, the sketches, everything that they need, they take it all the way down there just in case something goes wrong. So now what's happening is we're doing a pilot with them where all that information, that content, is going to go onto the glasses. And so that if they actually need step-by-step -step guidance or something goes wrong, they don't have to take all this paperwork with them. Basically, all the manuals in your car that you have, the owner's manuals, all that type of stuff goes into the glasses 
or into your smartphone or whatever device that you want to use that. So our area really challenges the content and bring that content into the glasses. So if you're a content delivery person, you'll make more money than anybody here <laughs> because they, they are really, really in demand right now is how to take that content and integrate it. Um, so there's a lot of companies today uh, such as in, in the uh, warehouse management system such as Shapiro and so forth. Uh, they have a lot of APIs that can drive that content through as much as you can. But our biggest area is, is that's our biggest challenge, not more in terms of mapping, but more in terms of the content area. Right. Got it. So uh, speaking of HoloLens, uh, so there are devices like HoloLens, uh, Magic Leap, uh, and the upcoming uh, AR headset uh, that Apple is uh, designing. So do we actually need the AR cloud? Because these devices would be able to do real-time spatial mapping and then be able to uh, you know, allow us to have a persistent multiplayer uh, type of experience. So, uh, so Aaron, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess the main thing is there's, there's two scenarios. One is the AR cloud is owned by the big companies. So Google has a pretty great AR cloud already called Google Street View. <laughs> so they've, they've mapped the whole world pretty well. Um, uh, or, you know, Apple's building their own. You know, they do the flyover stuff. Uh, and, you know, in Vancouver, you can pop open the, the map and go with 3D mode. And it's cool. You can see the building mass. And, and that's, you know, spatial data of the outside. Um, all of the companies, of course, uh, Microsoft included, are building mapping capabilities for indoors as well. Uh, but it's, it's a really hard problem to do it at industrial scale um, because we're talking like gigabytes of data for just this one room alone. So there is a real like data storage challenge there, uh, as well as like data distribution. And so to do it at an industrial scale to make it really work, I think is gonna be pretty challenging. But um, of course, you know, they're, mo they're motivated. They, and technology, it's, it's an, still on its exponential curve in so many interesting ways. Uh, so there's, there's a part, you know, plan B is um, the, the whole like thing that you're working on with the uh, distributed model. Uh, distributed models uh, where you could use like blockchain like technology to um, create like a consensus relationship between multiple parties you can create islands of information that are really relevant to everyone in that island so for example i'm looking under the hood of a vehicle um, gee i'd like to know how to take apart that vehicle and put it back together again well that spatial data is going to be the same from vehicle to vehicle pretty much almost exactly the same so you can generally have this consensus amongst you know, all the car owners of this vehicle that, yeah, that's the same. Um, really handy there. You so you could have a Wikipedia of, of that. You could also have islands of data in for indoor rooms and spaces like this. Any node, you just have to have a box in the room that happens to be on the same Wi-Fi, and it can just share that spatial information to anyone that's connected to it. And uh, that way, you can kind of reinforce like, the, the mapping of the environment as you need it. Um, you don't have to go ask or utilize an API that might cost you money uh, to use. And it doesn't have to be ad-backed, and you don't have to worry about privacy. So um, there's privacy implications around sharing interior space data, especially when it's your own home. And I think that really matters, <laughs> especially, you know, when it's like, oh, Cambridge Analytics got access to a lot of data that was pretty personal. Well, what if, you know, all of your Alexas and your stuff is all recording this stuff and gets abused in another way, it could be bad. Um, and I think it's exponentially worse when you have, um, you know, precise 3D mappings of every surface <coughs> on your body. <laughs> so. Fair enough. Um, I think that, back to your question, which was... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All oh, right. Yes. So they do real-time spatial mapping, but they're still uh, like a personal solution. So I feel like you still need uh, an AR cloud to hold on to, well, to be able to distribute content through that. Whereas the Hololens could do your house, and yes, uh, there's advantages to having an AR game that works just in your house, and you don't want to share that information. Uh, but also, if you were in a holo, using a HoloLens in a shared space, uh, for me as a developer, I need access to that shared space. Uh, so then we still need an AR cloud to be able to 
I, I think they're mutually exclusive, so. I think they just answered everything. I don't think I have to add anything to that. So. <laughs> well, all right, here's a question for you, Mo. Uh, so what kind of ROI are you seeing? I'm going for the seeing, big car. Yeah. The car. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of ROI are you seeing uh, in the enterprise space uh, with AR? Um, incredible. Yeah. So I'm just going to, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I brought up Porsche earlier, so I just, and I use that because it's a very successful example for us. Um, Porsche uh, came to us at a, an event called Field Service, and they saw us there, and they never heard about AR before. And they asked us to you know, learn a little bit more about it. And what they did was they decided to do a, a, a proof of concept at one location in San Diego um, with the dealership there. They proved the concept to be, uh, what their goal was, was that, I'm not sure if you know, anybody here own a Porsche? I'm just curious. OK. Anyway, so what they do is a guy goes and takes his car for, for service. The, the, the technician, if he can't fix it, he, he can't fix it, they open a ticket. The ticket goes to Atlanta. The expert in Atlanta is on the phone now with him maybe two days later and tries to fix that problem on the phone. If he can't fix it, there's a guy actually in BC that's called a field senior technician, and he's flying around in BC from dealership to dealership, and he flies into Vancouver here to your car, and then he goes and he tries to fix the problem. 98% of the time, he actually fixes the problem, which is great. The other 2% that he can't fix it, either the guy from Atlanta has to fly into Vancouver, or the, he's got no time, he doesn't have time to fly out here, so what they do is they take your car and they put it on a truck and they send it out to Atlanta. So that was their problem, right? So <laughs> this is a, the, 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 the idea was a complex issue that the customer had, and Porsche is all about their customer, getting their car back quickly. So their big thing was, how do we get that car back faster to the customer? And the average time to get a ca car back to a customer on a complex issue was about nine days. When they did this uh, proof of concept and they went, started with one location, uh, they saw you know, uh, an increase in, uh, sorry, reduced time. But they said, you know, is that this like one location? So they tried out uh, eight, nine locations. One was Vancouver here. And uh, they went from uh, nine, uh, nine days down to five days. So they saved 40% reduction in time. In addition to that, they saved about, in that uh, six-month pilot, they saved about $120,000 in uh, travel costs among their technicians. So wow. that's an ROI that you can see right away. Wow. And that's something, um, uh, you know, so the sexy part of the business is that, you know, we make money on subscription, the mm -hmm. customer saves money, and they, and they give a the customer a better experience. So mm -hmm. that's a, an example of an ROI right there. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Emery, how are we doing on time? One last question? Yeah. yeah? OK, cool. Yeah, so, the, so the AR cloud sounds like this you know, massive infrastructure to build. How realistic is it? Right? Are there any uh, concerns or risks? Uh, maybe, Aaron, you can start us off. Uh, concerns or risks? Well, I guess I touched on one. Yeah. <laughs> Privacy. So yeah, I mean, we've got cameras and sensors and stuff all like picking up all of the you know, sense, it could be sensitive. IP information, it could be like inside of a company, you got to map, if you're mapping out your company for uses internally, uh, you got to lock that down somehow. So I, I really think that that has to be really considered with any sort of AR cloud solution. We have to have some kinds of um, spatial privacy control um, that's part of the fabric. Um, so you can, you can create an island, um, that is like you know password protected or some some useful way, but it also has to be usable. So, if we were to create a, like a, a password protected cloud and you try to use it with a pair of glasses, like how do you punch in the password? You know, like that would be terrible. So it needs to be tied together somehow in a way that is completely seamless and doesn't get in the way, um, unlocks as you need it, and uh, and is just usable. Um, and I think that a, you know, a key to unlocking it is your spatial presence itself. I think that that in some way could be the key to unlocking uh, privacy, privacy encoded data uh, as a UX design goal, like as a way to actually make it move smoothly. So I don't know, it's an idea. Yeah, uh, I think we need standards. I think there's a lot of companies, uh, or not companies, who are they? Uh, open source standards like we've done in other industries as well. So when those standards uh, come
come into play, then that will tie up a lot of these issues with privacy uh, and also make it accessible. I think right now, if everybody is making their own version of the AR cloud, then they're not going to connect together very easily. Um, and I think that is what people are doing right now. I think Vancouver probably has four versions of a digital twin right now. Um, and I'm sure lots of other cities do as well. Um, and they don't speak nicely together. So uh, pulling this information all into one cohesive, shareable uh, format, I guess, is, is something that I would see as uh, very useful in the near future. In our space is security at the end of the day. So uh, we are on the cloud, so our platform is built, everything for the customer on the cloud. And I think the value to that is that because it's still new, we'll have a customer say, oh, by the way, can, th can you do this for us, right? Um, an example would be is in HVAC. We have a customer that we work with and they've already started using remote collaboration. But what they want to do is, um, or even the car business, right? So right now we're working in the same, same situation in the car business, is how many people here are taking their car for service in the last little while, right? And you go and they call you back at work and you get an estimate and they say, it's $1,000 to fix this. And you go, oh my God. Doesn't matter if it was 500 bucks, you still say, oh my God, right? At the end of the day, that's what we feel like. How do, like, how do you know it's worth 500 or 1,000? So in that case, the customer now wants what the uh, industry wants to do is they actually want you to be able to see that technician in front of your car while you're at your office and to pinpoint and show you exactly what it is before they give you the estimate, right? The security around that is like just ridiculous, right? So how do you, you know, it's again, privacy issues with security. So what we do is if a customer asks for something like that, we build it and put it onto the platform so every one of the industries can use the same type of product, right? So the same type of software solution. We don't do on-premise solution. So on-premise solution where a customer will say, you know what, we don't want you to go inside of our, our network. Um, if, and so what we'll try to do is like a private, like kind of, I guess, compromise with a, a private cloud, AR cloud within mm -hmm. our own oh. frame. Yeah. But security is the biggest, biggest issue that we find. That's right. the barrier for customers because it's a, it's a mindset for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to change the way they think. Uh, some of these organizations have been doing the same type of, you know, automotive has been doing the same thing for like, you know, 100 years, right? So having them to change their mindset to be able to get into uh, this AR cloud mm -hmm. environment versus yeah. an on-premise solution is a very difficult one, right? So, but it's getting there. Cool, awesome. Well, huge round of applause to our, uh, for our panelists tonight. Cool, awesome. So uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, I think, Amory, you're taking over. Um, so I wanted to invite up our last panel for the evening. Um, moderated, it's a location-based AR panel, so our moderator of Kate Wilson, um, if you could come up, with from the Georgia Strait. Um, we have Ryan Chapman from Motive.io. Uh, we have Miles from Questapon, and Daniel from Digit, who I haven't seen. So here's an open call, if anyone's working in location-based entertainment and would like to take the final fourth chair, you are welcome to come up. Otherwise, it'll be an intimate discussion. Anyone? Anyone? No? Okay. There you go. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Just the two of us. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for, uh, for coming tonight and for this is our second panel of the evening. So thank you for sitting so patiently and being so attentive. Um, as Amory says, we're going to be talking a bit about location-based AR which obviously fits into the AR cloud, but is a bit different. So I'd really like to explore with the, these two wonderful guys um, where location-based AR has come from, where, where we're at the moment, and how we can really push it forward. So a um, little bit about me, as Amory said, I, uh, I'm the tech staff writer at the Georgia Strait, which is um, Western Vancouver's largest news and entertainment weekly. Please feel free to pick it up out of the black news boxes, and that's the end of my plug. Um, <laughs> So I'll uh, just start with an easy question for you guys. Um, please introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your company. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Chapman. I'm uh, CEO of Motive.io. So we're uh, a general purpose um, AR, VR authoring system. Uh, we actually got started uh, primarily as a location-based gaming company. We've kind of evolved since then. Uh, so we're, we do still make location-based apps and games, uh, but we have a, an AR, VR authoring platform uh, that handles a lot of the content delivery and, and experience creation uh, issues around AR and VR. 
Um, I'm Miles from uh, Questapon, um, CEO. Uh, we started Questapon in 2011, and I believe we were the first AR location-based game. Um, if you remember, probably about six, seven years ago, about 250 million people, quarter billion, knew about uh, the Sasquatch and legends that were dropped around the world, like Pokemon Go, but quite a few years earlier. Unfortunately, not everyone had a smartphone at that time, so. Um, yeah, and since then, uh, we came mostly in tourism, um, so right across the province. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll talk more later. Awesome. That's great. So I think my first question for you guys is to really, we've had a great overview here of where um, AR and cloud AR is at, at the moment. So I'd really like to just kind of dig in and use your expertise to, to discuss where the technology comes from, what kind of the history of it is, because I know that you've both been there since pretty much the genesis. So what are the technologies that have kind of coalesced to be able to let us make location-based AR and how has that kind of evolved to where we are at the present? Sure. So uh, I, I think the reality is that the technology has been around for, for almost 10 years. Uh, certainly we've seen an evolution in terms of what you're able to do. Uh, but, but a good chunk of, of what you actually need, uh, GPS, a compass, access to uh, a mapping system and points of interest, um, have been around for a while. So I, I do think that, I, I think that less of what's missing is, is a purely technology uh, issue. Um, I really think what's missing are compelling use cases and compelling applications of the technology. Um, I think AR Cloud is going to be fantastic. I don't think it's necessary to make a really compelling location-based experience. I think it's going to make them better. Um, but I do think uh, a big part that's been missing has been um, an education both on the side of the developers and the consumers for exactly what's possible with, uh, with location-based uh, augmented reality. Um, I, I think one of the challenges, and, and I um, to kind of give it an, a, a bit of a background of where we started, we actually started as a gaming company. Uh, one of my partners is actually a, a filmmaker by trade. Um, and, and he was uh, an, an early innovator in, in web video, so you know, predating even the location-based space. And one of the things he, he was saying in, in the early stages of, of uh, making his Tiki Bar TV, um, uh, if, if you've heard of it, um, uh, web video, is that he was one of the few people actually building content for the web that wasn't other people trying to educate people on how to build content for the web. So one of the big pieces that, that I think is missing right now is not so much a technology problem, it's that te technologists like us are still the gatekeepers um, for creating all sorts of augmented reality, whether it's location-based, uh, you know, whether it's headset-mounted. Um, that's the problem that we're trying to solve with Motive, is to open that um, capacity up to, you know, content creators and creative people, because, you know, I really think the biggest innovation that's missing, again, is not so much a technology problem, it's the fact that we're not letting, you know, the storytellers in the world, the, the creative people in the world, um, create these, these kind of experiences uh, as easily as possible. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, I come from uh, the mobile side uh, background with Play Mobility prior to doing uh, what we were doing with uh, it was Legend Tracker and then uh, Quest Upon. But uh, like Pokemon, we had kind of a, a real peak and then a drop. And um, augmented reality is really cool. Uh, it's flashy at first, but unless you wrap it into a story, and I mean uh, with locations. VR is awesome. VR is great for right here, things around us, fantastic. AR has the ability to not just have something appear right in front of you here, but I mean in the place where it's supposed to be. And so we began these stories where we, hey, uh, traveling time is fantastic. We take a city and we look at the stories and we bring these things to life. I mean, the characters are walking down the street, uh, you're looking back in time, uh, you uh, answer some trivia, you find something in the real space and you answer questions about it, which tell a story. And um, if these stories were like music, AR is just one chord. And so we built this platform that allows people to develop these quests um, and we use them ourselves to calibrate in the real world. But um, just simply going and dropping things all over the place, like we did the Gold Rush Trail, which is going from California to Alaska. Um, I think there's a few hundred locations right across BC. But if we just drop things in, oh, there's a gold gold panner, great. Uh, Tau on five times and collect some gold. 
it doesn't mean much, um, but we wrap around these stories and we have this ad adventure this way and it, it is the content that's needed. It's, uh, it, it's not about the technology. I mean, back in the days we had to deal with stuff where, I mean, magnetic declination, where <laughs> that's not true north, that's true north, and it would shift things. And we'd have to pay attention to altitudes and the calibrating things. We've all been doing the cloud stuff for years because uh, we'd have uh, clients of ours uh, maybe five hours away, eight hours away, and they would actually use Quest Upon whatever for calibrating things. And I would see what they're calibrating, and we're like, okay, cool, it looks good to me, look good to you, yeah, great. Uh, now you get, to, and we never put too much effort into the augmented reality tools that we knew were gonna be core at one point. When I was a developer and architecting for a lot of the manufacturers of the smartphones, um, we, we know what happens. These features like AR are gonna be built into the phones one day. But what do you do in the meantime, wrapping around with this story, how you use this stuff? And uh, yeah, so it's the content. And uh, how you use AR is gonna be uh, the big thing. Yeah, I think I totally agree with you there. So we've touched a little bit on the other panel about what the best use cases would be for the AR cloud, but on a more kind of specific location-based AR sense, you're both from the gaming world in a sense and creating things that would help people facilitate games. So what for you are the most interesting kind of innovative or imaginative use cases you can see for location-based AR? <laughs> well, so if we, we've all been doing this stuff for so long and it's uh, usually it's about six, seven years before now, so um, we're innovators. And uh, um, so pulling something out of stealth mode would be really <laughs> stupid because I honestly think some of the stuff we're doing is, is uh, the absolute coolest. Uh, I, I can go back quite a few years though. I love the fact of uh, making games and felt guilty that uh, you know, my son becomes a game addict and stuff like this. And, and uh, how do I get him outside? So uh, to create things that were actually moving was awesome. Uh, the time it was, uh, the first one I did was Yogo Pogo. So not only in the map do you see it actually traveling up uh, the lake and come out and everyone sees it in the same place, but um, I would actually have to test this by pulling off the computer, getting into a car and watching the map in time myself to hit this bridge at the right time um, to be able to see that uh, Ogo Pogo as it's going underneath the, and Tammy and I, my partner, we'd actually sometimes miss things. We'd have to drive half an hour up the lake, and oh, I could see it coming, I could see it coming, here it comes, and that, that was cool stuff then, but uh, nothing's, I mean, like the big stuff's yet to come. You just watch, uh, I mean, the world's open, <laughs> it's great. So a follow-up question there for you, what's the, what's the big stuff then? <laughs> It, it, it's a it's a good question, and and I do think that that in some ways we're we're still trying to figure out what that answer is. Um, I think that um, you know cer certainly it, it's easy to talk about evolution again of of what we're seeing today. Um, I, I think gaming has a long way to go. Uh, I, I think you know Pokemon just scratched the surface. I mean, it scratched it brilliantly, but it but it really scratched the surface. Um, I do think that you know a lot of talk about bringing social to that. I think that's a part of it. Um, I but I think it's very important to to start focusing again on on the individual experience and, and don't just kind of rely on on social as as a catch all uh, way way to to kind of build it out. Um, so, but it, you know, certainly gaming. Um, I mean, the biggest uptake we're seeing in the location AR space is, is probably in the tourism marketing. Um, we're doing a bunch of apps for the government of Canada for the Ottawa region. So, um, you know, where these people are, I, I think one thing that's really important to kind of keep in mind is that everybody in this room just has an innate understanding of what location-based AR is. Um, the vast majority of of the everyday person still is is amazed by what Google Maps can do uh, by default, right? So, so we, we have a long way to go, and, and, and I think that what we, you know, what we really need to look for at, before we even start contemplating the big stuff are what, what are those low-hanging fruit? You know, where, where are the easy places where we can start to um, give people the kind of memorable experiences um, that, that are going to make them look for more, want more? Um, and, and I think, you know, in that space, it's, it's going to be more games, it's going to be more, more tourism, but I definitely would encourage everybody to, to think as much about the individual, one single person experience when you're thinking about AR, and, and don't just assume that, you know, opening it up and creating a social uh, environment is, is going to solve all of the problems. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting take on it, because I feel like that's perhaps counterintuitive to a lot of the stuff that we're hearing, and is obviously a very valid inroad to it. So. Um, my question to that would be, what do you feel goes into making a really great location-based AR app? What are those components that draw people in or something that you see 
some commonalities you can kind of place through those apps that have been really successful. So I'd, I'd encourage everybody to visit Motive.io, uh, <laughs> check out our pricing page. Um, no, I, 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 so I think, um, uh, you know, I, it, it's, like, it's like Miles was saying, um, stories have, have been with us for as long as we could communicate. Um, I, I, I think that refocusing on the stories, every place is unique, every place has stories that it can tell. Um, and, and, and to me, the best location-based experiences are going to be ones that acknowledge that and take advantage of that. Um, I, I do think one, one thing, a, a mindset that I think, again, you know, we, we tend to get it, we tend to get into in this room, um, is, is that there's always going to be a screen involved, there's always going to be, you know, a, a lot of stuff. Um, and, and I would say there's definitely a time and a place for that, um, but you don't always need to obscure the real world with a digital one. Um, the real world's a, a pretty phenomenal place. Um, you're not going to find a, a more richly textured or rendered environment in, in any, you know, doesn't matter how good your video card is. Um, and, and sometimes, sometimes you, you should consider that to be the setting, truly the setting, and that what you're, what you're building should be about augmenting that, you know, really, truly extracting from that what makes that place special and unique. I 100% agree. You know, first messing with AR, we could have put a coffee cup on top of a coffee table. Um, I've seen that before. You know, I got a lot of those things. I've, and, and it's uh, the, if the canvas is the real world, that's amazing. You know, actually, there's a really cool um, example of this, and I might get some of the dates off, but it was uh, in regards to the difference between two um, Hulk movies. One was uh, very low quality. Um, uh, the CGI was weak. And uh, one, uh, three, four years later, another one was done just amazingly, but it was all VR. The first one, even though the CGI of uh, the Hulk was poor, it was against a backdrop of um, the Bay Area. I mean, the, the real video. And people were more attached to that. They felt that was more real because the eye actually tricked you. Um, you. You stick something that could be just even horrible CGI in a real world, and your brain will make that real. It is amazing. Um, but anyways, I completely agree. It's uh, throw it into the real world. That's great. That's really awesome. Uh, something I wanted to pick up on as well, you, you started to mention hardware there in your answer, Ryan. So I feel like I have the inevitable hardware question. We, you know, we see AR at the moment through, through tablets, screens, or, or headsets. So how do you see that evolving in regards to location-based AR? How do, we, how do we push that forward? And, and how, what's that going to look like in the future for us? Oh, sure. Um, so uh, I, I think, um, so it's, it's kind of interesting that we, and again, we, we all, you know, we talk about headsets and, and screens and, and that sort of thing. Um, w one thing I would definitely say is don't discount audio. Uh, audio is very much part of, of creating aug augmented reality experience. Um, audio is the one way that you can deliver content to somebody without obscuring um, the real world. So I, I think um, Bose, for example, has a really interesting initiative right now. They've launched a, a fund and, and they've launched their own um, AR platform for, for creating um, 3D audio. Um, we actually did a, a project um, with a group out of Times Square where we mapped the sounds of the Amazon rainforest to the streets in and around Times Square. And uh, you know, the idea of being kind of mixing the concrete jungle and, and the real jungle. Um, but it was a purely audio experience. You know, the app was just there to, to bring you through and, and the, you know, the, the avenues were, were rivers and you, as you approached them, you heard, you, know, you heard the rushing water and as you, you know, meandered through Times Square, you'd hear, you know, you'd pass underneath a beehive and you'd hear a, a beehive. Um, so I, I actually, I'm probably more excited about the innovations in, in uh, location-based audio uh, as, as an AR delivery device. Um, I, you know, certainly count me skeptical uh, as far as, you know, whether I truly believe that every person on the planet is going to be wearing an AR uh, device on their, on their head at all time. I think, you know, the laser eye surgery market would, would strongly suggest that people, people don't always, always want that. Um, you know, I, I think that there's absolutely going to be a time and a place, and again, I come back to uh, tourism uh, training, education as, as amazing use cases where, where, you know, I think the headsets are going to be really, really valuable. Um, but, uh, but I do think, you know, I, I do think one of, one of the things that we tend to forget is, is the audio uh, side of the equation. I do like uh, the wearable side of it. Um, mixing that with audio is awesome. 
Uh, you know, the ability to run around in the real world, uh, have goggles on, where, uh, you know, six, seven of my friends are doing this, but in amongst us is a bunch of dinosaurs, and we're running around, and they're chasing us, we're in a field, maybe uh, golf courses. Um, we experimented with stuff like this, where things are chasing you and whatnot, and it's very hard with the phone, and I tried strapping a uh, the phone to an actual ball cap about six, seven years ago, which was just ridiculous. Uh, thought about cutting a hole in Google -Go Cardboard. Um, but the ability to have something lightweight and it also very, you know, GPS is only so good, you know, um, but even there's beacons and whatnot or very quick image recognition to be able to wear a lightweight device and run around an environment where some of the stuff's AR, get jolts if something actually hits you, um, like laser tag, but to the next level. Um, that stuff could be pretty wild because uh, if you get people off the couch, um, right now we got them walking, get them off the couch and get them running, you know, Anything to get people off the couch, right? Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, we've kind of gone through a little bit about the history and what's really great about location-based AR, but it, it kind of seems to me like we've had this technology now for, as you mentioned, nearly kind of 10 years. Obviously, it's it's got much better in its, in its latest iterations, but what is it that you feel that's inhibiting that kind of mass adoption or, uh, I guess, mass, mass familiarity at, at the very least? So well, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I, I think I, I think the issue is, um, and it's kind of a it goes in a number of steps. But the the biggest issue is is a lack of content, a lack of really accessible um, uh, experiences that make sense for people, um, and and I, you know. It hasn't been to me. It's not the technology hasn't been the hasn't been the the, the boundary. I, I think um, the, the biggest challenge, and, and I'll reiterate it, you know, is is the fact that not very many people know how to build good location based experiences. It's uh, um, it, it's not easy. Uh, it, it requires a very different um, take on on the environment. Um, I mean, I've worked with with game designers who have a lot of trouble with it um, because they're used to controlling everything about the environment. And with a location-based experience, it's exactly the opposite. You're very much at the mercy of it. So I I think that technology has has been much less of a barrier than than you know awareness of of what it is that actually can can makes a compelling location-based experience. Um, you know, again, with Motive, that's what we're, we're trying to solve a part of that problem by, by giving tools to everybody who can, who can create them. Um, but I, but it, there's very much a chicken and egg. Ultimately, I think what'll drive adoption is, is a lot more Pokemons. Um, you know, a, a lot more, a lot more digestible experiences that, that make sense. Um, again, I, I, I think you, we, we see a lot of location-based AR that exists for its own purpose. I, I, you know, a lot of, I mean, gimmicks. Alex was mentioning that, um, and and I, you know, they don't they don't serve that bigger that bigger kind of need. I, if you think of what made Pokemon really really special, uh, it had very little to do with, with the technology. It had very little to do with the graphics or any of that. Um, it it worked because it connected with people on an emotional level, right? And and that's that, that to me is what's missing. So we can throw as much technology at this problem as we want, but until we actually teach developers and, and content creators how to use location-based AR, location-based technologies to create compelling experiences, I think we're gonna continue to be um, blocked and be looking, f looking for the breakthrough. I, th I think one thing that might help things move forward um, is the rewards because uh, years ago, I remember when we uh, launched this one quest um, and there was this big announcement thing for the day and uh, these teens came running down, they're ready to go and they had a pa paper map of, uh, and wh where did this come from? Um, these elderly lady made a walking path of the same thing we did. And I'm like, here's these 22 year old guys and, and, and they're not using the smartphone thing that everything's coming to life. And they're like, and I go, why aren't you guys using this? Because this, you're gonna win beer, man. And I'm like, holy cow, I couldn't believe it. So a lot of the things that are working more for us are, for example, the BC Lions, one of our clients. Um, you know, there's airships flying through the stadium, and wow, that's cool. And then it's dropping up drones to the people, great. 
but the fact that people have this, you know, the first 10 win this, the next 10 win this, or we have parachutes dropping down uh, Save On Foods delivery trucks over uh, the city and stuff like that, and you might win a year's worth of groceries. There's that whole tangible side too, I mean, where there's actual real world rewards. Um, and if some of these places are brick and mortar, and uh, they require people to get off the couch and they're location based, um, maybe uh, this is another way where the things can tie together. And I know uh, Foursquare's tried it, we tried it way in the past, but um, you throw more of a story into it and uh, it might become more successful. Gonna make it good then. <laughs> um, yeah, so just for our last question, I think it'd be really great if you could highlight what the trends are and location based they are right now at the moment, and then what you think those trends might be next year, because the technology is evolving so fast. I feel like with your expertise, you might be able to give some insight into what that's gonna look like. Uh, well, at the risk of, um, uh, <laughs> I got to go check with the legal department and the NDAs um, that we have signed. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I, I think you'd, I, I think the short-term trends are going to be again. Um, you know, it, it, it's been interesting in the in the uh, at, kind of in the last two years since Pokemon was was released because it it did a lot to um, raise awareness, um, but then we saw a bit of a, a real. I would almost consider it a crash. Almost nobody else followed up with with really compelling, um, uh, good examples of of other ways to do it. Um, I I don't expect anything earth sh earth shattering in in the next few years, um, in terms of of you know really fundamental kind of seismic shifts in terms of what people are doing. But I do expect, and I know that we're building some of them. I do expect to start seeing more easily accessible, easily digestible AR, location-based AR experiences. And, and I, I think this is another example of a place where, you know, more technology isn't going to solve the adoption problem right now. What's going to solve the adoption problem are, are compelling, engaging experiences that, that make sense as location-based augmented reality experiences as opposed to, you know, just taking an idea and mapping it on it, throwing it on a map and hoping that that, make, that, that, that works. Um, so, so I, what I'm seeing, uh, you know, coming down the pipeline on location-based AR is a lot more engagement among traditionally more more conservative markets like tourism um, and and a few others I can't mention. But um, you know, I I think what we're going to start seeing are are finally some good marriages between more traditional businesses and 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 the location based ar um, technology so nothing nothing huge and earth shattering I, I unless somebody in this room has has better information i don't expect ar cloud to be ready for me to use it by by the fall so i think that what we're going to be seeing is more uh, just just more more things that are that that connect with people on on that more emotional and and uh, kind of casual level that i think will start to really drive the adoption yeah, I, it's uh, definitely on the emotion side because uh, when you make a movie, you, you, if you're an author and you write this great story and you turn it into a movie, you're, uh, nowadays they're basically trying to hit the center of the demographic. Um, so it's one movie. And um, the ability to get biofeedback on how you're feeling about something that allows the AR to change depending on where, what your mode is. Uh, your mood is mode. <laughs> I guess uh, that's a mode in a way. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I think uh, that's, that's where things are going to get pretty interesting too, is uh, knowing how it's uh, actually affecting you. Uh, just as the real world uh, gives us uh, the air and uh, the sense of place and how it makes the AR, AR wild, um, there's a lot of other factors of how I'm feeling um, and how I should be feeling or how the brand wants you to feel. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to Ryan and Miles here for uh, all their insights. And thank you to you guys for being such an awesome audience. So uh, give them a round of applause. We're just about to go to networking and food and drinks. I just wanted to call up Charles. Charles from Lama Zoo, once again, thank you for sponsoring the food and booze this evening, Charles. We appreciate it. Um, Charles, just want to say a few words, and then we'll get on to seeing demos by Kitty Kong, which you must check out. I tried it at AW, and it was amazing. Lama Zoo is doing a demo. Uh, Motivio, Ryan, who just spoke, is doing a demo. And then please visit our friends at Seagraph as well at the back. So here you go.
Cool. Thank you so much. I'll keep it quick because I know we all want to get to the networking and drinks. Uh, but uh, yeah, to give you guys a little bit of backstory, those of you who may or may not know me, I'm on the, uh, the, the board of directors for the VRAR Association. Missed a few of the last events, so I felt really bad. Wanted to come back and kind of sponsor, but also we're unveiling our Jetson VR product, which is launching <coughs> today or tomorrow on, on the Windows Mixed Reality App Store. And it kind of goes back to our original roots when we started the company. We created a uh, product for anatomy education, and we've kind of since moved away from that, but we felt that we wanted to really create a rich VR and MR product that uh, really encapsulated that. So come check it out in the back corner. Enjoy the networking and the drinks.